all of this started when I was a grad student at University of Wisconsin, and I was in computer science. Not as a, uh, not at that time with any thought of the arts or being an artist. But I did care um, in a more personal sense than a technical sense about the computer and what it was like to use one. And there were things that I, I resented about computers. I resented the fact that I had to sit down to use them. Uh, I resented the fact that I was using a 100-year-old device to operate them, a keyboard, and the fact that I was using, um, that it was denying that I had a body of any kind, and that it wasn't perceptual. It was all sort of symbolic. And I looked at, I was trying to find out the best way of making a computer, and I started thinking that artists had the best relationship, artists and musicians had the best relationships to their tools. So I started thinking about the arts and taught a class for artists to use the computer. And then I just started getting more interested in not teaching anything in the normal sense, but in communicating the essence of computers and trying to make it so that you would experience a computer rather than learn to use one or learn to do something efficient with it. And that that is essentially the role of, of an artist to express something. And I was thinking almost of expressing the computer the same way that uh, the religious painters would express the scripture. I, technological positivist. I loved the possibilities of technology. I didn't love the fact of, uh, of what I found. So in the first environment, I was the computer. I s sat at a data tablet in the computer center in Wisconsin, and I drew on that data tablet, and what I drew appeared on the computer screens, was transmitted a mile away to the gallery where it was superimposed on the live image of people. And what they saw was a projected image of themselves and graffiti that I was drawing on top of them. And then together we invented a medium, so it by accident occurred that they were, one day I was following somebody's finger, and it looked like they were drawing. They thought they were drawing, and all of a sudden, the finger was magic, and they were just moving their finger on the screen. They, there would be groups of people, and one person would be drawing, the other person would take it from them, and we just discovered the, that there was this very natural desire to identify with the image on the screen. Their image was them, and uh, they expected it to do things in the video world as much as it did in the physical world. That was, it was as if evolution had prepared us for seeing ourselves on uh, television screens combined with computer images. We're reenacting what, or acting out a plan that was conceived uh, and proposed as far back as 1972. I made an endowment grant uh, proposal called Video Touch, where two people would be in different environments. And where they, when they t their images touched on the screen, they would each see the same image in their respective environment. In 74, the video play system, this system, uh, actually started its, uh, its existence. As early as 74, I could, the computer could see you and the computer could find whether a point on the screen was part of you. It could find your edges in real time and respond in limited ways. But I was always sort of shooting, I always had the complete medium in mind and wanted to do nothing less than the complete medium. Uh, the medium is, okay, this is a study for the piece that we'll be doing at SIGGRAPH. The interaction between a large image the hands and the small image of the person. Now we'll be doing both uh, scenes where the human is full size and or the full body is full size and the hands are, are this size. But also the main, one of the main attractions is the juxtaposition of large and small. So that the two people will now interact and, and to some extent discover what uh, the possibilities are what is suggested emotionally by, by scale. 
And this is just is part of the general video place concept of people getting together uh, in the artificial reality. In other words, what, what's happening now between the two people, if this is a live image, is that we are now interacting in a way that humans have never, never could. And now what does that, uh, what does that suggest? Simple as this is, it starts to suggest the kinds of things that we'll be able to do. So what I've done is peddle my technical skills doing uh, computer graphics for, uh, for companies like uh, Pratt & Whitney. This particular effect, as a matter of fact, I've applied to the flow of uh, gas through jet engines and applied to mathematically modeled data. So you can see this follow and know that all of the paths being taken are uh, scientifically correct. So you're looking at it's a way of visualizing scientific information. Since 84, uh, Katrin Henriksen is over here, has been working with me and has done uh, much of the technical work. And she's been uh, responsible for a lot of the advances that we've we've had in the way of, uh, of hardware and software, especially in the, uh, in the perception end. And so this is, uh, it's always been a little bit like making a movie, if you think about what the ultimate ambition here is, is something that is, uh, would have uh, interactive uh, animation, not animation, but interactive animation that was sensitive to what, not just what was going on in the environment, but what, in a static sense, but what was going on, say, in a person responding to a person as terrain, instant by instant? Uh, so you're really talking almost about AI, and uh, uh, in fact, it's as realistically AI as most AI, because most AI is talking uh, about some tiny fragment of perception of, of the intelligence function, and uh, this system is a real-time behaving. Uh, creature in some sense, which perceives, makes judgments, and, uh, and responds in a 30th of a second. And intelligence has always been a real-time phenomenon. 